Okay, you guys, uh, you guys ready to go ahead and get started with our study? Yes. You know, the way it is around here, when we start two minutes late, we go ten minutes over. So, we have been studying the book of Romans, and we'll see if we, if we finish up chapter five this morning or not. But really, we kind of need to. <laughs> because that's really talking about the same thing. At least get through verse 19. That, that's, that's, that's a must. And so, uh, if you've been here for uh, the Roman study, or especially last week, we've, uh, we've gone over justification and how that stuff works. And so, uh, we know that we've been justified because somehow Christ took our place on the cross. But how is that substitution possible? And, and what I mean by that um, is the fact that Christ can actually substitute for me. We kind of, I think, sometimes don't understand how this works. You know, if it was even theoretically possible that I could live a perfect life, can, can, my, um, can, I, can I substitute somebody else's penalty? And it count? And the answer is no, I can't. So Romans, the rest of Romans is going to talk about, you know, the, you know, we, we know we're justified because Christ took our substitutionary um, uh, place. He substituted um, himself for us. But why is that even an option? Romans 5, the rest of this chapter explains that. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father and Lord, I, I just thank you for the truths of Scripture. And I just thank you that you've saved us and you revealed yourself to us you've not left us in a place of ignorance you've given us your word that we might understand these things i'm going to glorify you in our lives i'm going to glorify you in this church and father i just pray for discernment upon each of us as we open your word pray for services to follow pray for those who are traveling or those who can't be with us pray for your saints all across this world amen bless you <laughs> And so again, I think sometimes we we forget that you know I can't just take somebody else's place and cover their sin. And we just sometimes attribute the the answer. Many just attribute the answer to Christ's substitution that he could do it because he was God, when in fact it's not. That's not really the right answer. His death was acceptable because he was perfect, righteous, and he was God. But why is it that he could actually substitute himself for me? You ever considered that? Well, Romans 5 tells us why. Romans 5 tells us the same reason why sin and unrighteousness was imputed unto you because of Adam. It's the same reason why righteousness can be imputed unto you. By one man, sin entered the world. And by one man, Justification of life. Amen. Yes, amen. And how that works. Romans 5, the rest of these rest of this chapter tells us how that works. So that's going to be the goal to try to explain all of this. Because we understand that it wasn't just and I, and I say this, he'd say it that way, it wasn't just God that died for us. It was the God man, Christ Jesus, that died for us. And it was the, he had to become a man for this all to be possible. He couldn't just say, okay, I'll come down and I'll show up on September 12th and I'll go to the cross. And No, he had to come. There had to be a man who did it. Um, there was the quandary that the world was in. So turn me to actually before we begin to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <laughs> Part of verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And you hath he quickened, talking about the believer, you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past 
in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God. That should stop you in your tracks. Who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. You understand, our salvation is God's workmanship. This whole plan of salvation, the fact that there's redemption that's offered, the fact that, that in Christ that we have all of these spiritual blessings, that's, that goes back to before the foundations of the world was ever laid, he had a plan, a redemptive plan, that's his workmanship. The salvation that you have today is part of that very workmanship, and this is what Romans 5 is going to explain to us. Ephesians here is telling us what took place. Romans 5, verses 12 through basically 19, are going to tell you how it took place. So giving you the context, that's what I want you to understand, is Romans 5, 12, as we're going to see, is going to tell you, get answers some questions that maybe you've pondered, or maybe you already studied out and you know the answers. Sometimes, maybe there are questions you've not even had yet. But I, again, I told you before, I think that when we get to glory, we're going to realize that there was much more to all of this stuff than we ever comprehended. Romans 5, 12 through 19 is going to give you a piece of that. It's going to give you a piece of how this all fit together. All right, go back to Romans. Romans chapter 5. Now as we, we read uh, this... We'll read verses 12 through 19 and then kind of backtrack on it. As we read this, I want you to pay attention to a couple of different things. One is the word one. I counted 12 times that word is going to be used in these verses. Just through verses 12 through 19, the word one is used 12 times. It's, going to, it's trying to drive home a point here. Uh, and the other word I want you to pay attention to is much more. Or uh, phrase, I should say. Five times you're going to see that used, much more, talking about the idea that, that you know, we, we have this issue um, from being in Adam, but the things that we lost in Adam, we gained much more in Christ Jesus. So as much as we think of the things that we lost, God's plan of salvation, God's gift of eternal life, the things that he's going to give us, in Christ we have much more than what man ever lost through Adam. I want you to concentrate on at least let those things sink in as we read these verses. So let's read verses 12 through 19. He says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man. Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Not as it was by one man that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
as by the offense of one judgment came upon all to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. There's a lot there. But hopefully you can kind of see um, what's being discussed here. Yeah. I would uh, do this normally, but it, uh, it's so important that you can't expose a word in verse 30. You said, oh. uh, for to the law, sin was in in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no sin. Oh, when there is no law. Right. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of yeah. important. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing I want you to pay attention to is you're, is you're reading this, as you're studying this. And if you got a King James, it'll have this. I know the New King James has this. Um, other versions don't have this, um, which I think it's, it's pretty important here. Is Notice this parentheses that you have beginning in verse 13, ends in verse 17. So what you have is, is verse 12, and, and then from 13 to 17 is an, basically an explanation, but 12 and, and 18 go together. So you should be able to read verse 12 and 18, and then verses 13 through 17 fill in more information. So read verse 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification in life. And you see how those come together? Well, verses 13 through 17, this parenthesis in there is giving you more details. I'm happy to do that sometimes whenever I write emails. And I, I'm so thankful for this because I'm like the king of run-on sentences, okay? You know, I, I can, next thing I know, I've got a whole paragraph that's one sentence. And so here what you see really is, is this one sentence continuing on. And there is so much, so much here. So, so what do we see here? We see that sin entered, verse 12, um, by one man and death by sin. And the one thing I want to point out here, because it recently came up, is that um, if sin came by one man, does that mean uh, Adam ate the fruit first? No, it is ate it willfully first. Bingo. Not being deceived. This actually came up recently, and... Um, when you don't understand how stewardship works, and understand that there was, there was a difference between positionally Eve's position and Adam's position. Adam had a position of stewardship, and Eve didn't. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. If uh, you guys have been here for our 1 Timothy study, you might recall uh, us looking at this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 Whenever Paul is talking about the roles of men and women, he mentions verse 13, the order of creation. And in verse 14, he says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So how can she be in the transgression, but Adam brought sin? Well, it's because she usurped Adam's authority. And it was because Adam sinned that sin came into the world. Eve took first, but it was Adam's sin. It was his his disobedience, because we, as we're going to see here, these verses teach here, we belong to the race of Adam. Hopefully you don't anymore. I titled this, this study, you're either, it's in, in Adam or in Christ. We, we, this world gets all caught up with racism and all these races. I'll, I'll tell you right now, Bible teaches two. One's leading straight to hell, this one's leading... Had, brings you justification. And that's what these passages are teaching us. You can either be in Adam or you can be in Christ. And we come from the race of Adam, and it was when Adam sinned, it was whenever he did it, when he willfully uh, disobeyed that sin entered the world and death came because of sin. 
That's what this is talking about here. Skeptics and doubters like to cry that that's unfair, that the idea that, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that I'm going to die because of what Adam did? Sounds unfair on, on the surface, doesn't it? But you know that this actually shows God's wisdom, as we would expect anything God would do. It also shows God's grace. It shows that God is um, above whenever he says that my ways are above your ways. Do you realize that it's because that we're all in the lineage of Adam and death came by one man's sin that salvation can come by one man too? If you take one, you don't get the other. Who wants to bet your life that you're going to live a life of righteousness? It ain't going to happen. Because it's not an accident that God created only one man. Whenever he created the angels, he created a bunch of them, didn't he? This is the reason why angels cannot be saved. They don't have the offer of redemption because they're not a race. They, are, they were created they sin, they're judged individually. God created one man, and we all flow from him. Knowing, knowing, as we're going to see here, that Adam was actually a type of the Christ who would come. God knowing what would happen, and when that one man sinned, he was able to bring justification based upon one. Wives, if we've got a situation where... Uh, where uh, you, know, you have a position where you're under the umbrella of your husband. Do you want to bet your righteousness on your husband's actions? No. And you see the wisdom. You see the wisdom of God? Do you see what he's, he's doing here? By the mere fact of having it by one man, he's able to bring justification and salvation by one man. And that's, that's what he's talking about here. So again... Um, would you want your eternity to be determined? Do you want to be created like the angels, where you were created individually and your eternity rests solely upon you? Because that's really what you're asking if you're saying that this is unfair. If it was unfair for anybody, it was unfair for God. So that's what's going on here. And again, if you've ever wondered why an angel can't be saved, this is why an angel can't be saved. Because we are from the lineage, we are from the race of Adam. And I think that um, it's interesting when you think of how creation was done. He created just the one man. We are born, uh, well, look, look at verse 14 here. Romans 5, 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Ammon's Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam was a figure of the one that was to come. It was no shock or surprise that man sinned. It was no shock or surprise to God that man would sin. The idea of creating man necessitated a means for man to be redeemed. Because man, I don't care which of us, you know, we may think, man, that, that Adam, he sure sure messed up. Well, he sure messed up, that's for sure. But each one of us would have done the same thing. And if, if, if you don't know that, then you need to study your Bible some more. Because each and every one of us would have done the same thing. So the only options here, people, is don't make humanity. Or make humanity with the plan of redemption. And God understood how that plan of redemption had to be planned out. And the other thing is, as is, is you consider these verses, what, what is being discussed here, when you consider that this says, by one man sin entered, and by one man's sin death entered, you have to understand this is why uh, the, the issue of evolution is so important. Because what is being what Paul is doing here, he's taking us all the way back to Genesis 1 through 3. And as soon as the church begins to accept evolution, as soon as, as soon as man begins to believe in evolution, you undermine the whole basis of justification. 
Not only do you undermine how creation was done, and that's bad enough, but we just saw that Adam was a type of the one that would come. And when you remove Adam, it, you remove that sin that Adam did. When you remove all of that and insert it with millions and billions of years and death before sin, and you insert all of that kind of stuff, you've just undermined justification. You've just undermined God's plan of redemption. You see how big of an issue this is? That's how enormous this is. This, it's not so many people think. I mean, the Catholic Church has accepted for many, many years. Many churches out there are teaching Millions and billions of years and all, all kinds of stuff. It is a huge issue. Romans 5 takes you back to Genesis 1. And if you can't accept Genesis 1, then you're, you're dismissing Romans 5. And it really is that simple. Death, is, as we saw here, passed unto all as a result of what Adam did. And because of what Adam did... Um, Paul is getting ready to have to explain here because he's going to be bringing the law into this. A lot of people, I think, get, get confused by this passage thinking that, well, how is it that people died before the law came into place? Well, that's part of what Paul is explaining here and what you have to understand. That, that is because we're part of Adam's race. We're from his lineage. We, say, we see things... Matter of fact, you, you might be familiar with the passage where it says that Levi gave tithes to Melchizedek. Well, Levi wasn't born yet. Levi hadn't been born yet. Isaac wasn't born yet. But yet the scripture says Levi did, and it said exactly how, because he was in Abraham's loins. So you see what the scripture's doing there? Do you see you, whether you like it or not, you're from the loins of Adam. You're from the race of Adam. When he sinned, that affected you. That affected our nature. That affected, that brought death, that brought sin. And so whenever it says here that for all have sinned, at the, at verse, the end of verse 12, for that all have sinned, even though we know, because you can go to Romans chapter 3 and we can see it's specifically talking about all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This here is in the context all have sinned within Adam is what it's talking about. In Adam, that sin is in us. That sin nature is in us. That death has passed on to us. Matter of fact, look at Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For anybody who wants to suggest that, wait a minute, I could have done it perfect? Yeah. Try living one day perfect, let alone one week, one month. You know, that's just not going to happen. There's no excuse that we can lay at God. The main thing, I, I think, that again, that I would drive home here, the point is, is that God saw the helpless situ situation, and he, he created Adam knowing what would happen. He created Adam knowing what would happen, and knowing that Christ would have to be, to be that one, uh, one person, that one man, who lived righteously, perfectly as a sacrifice so that we could no longer be imputed Adam's sin, but be, be imputed Christ's righteousness. And that's what, what God did. It's unfortunate that so many in the world today want to say that God doesn't exist because look at the world. It's sin. Look at injustice. Look at all these, these different things that are going on, pain and suffering. I don't believe in God because of all the pain and suffering. How could there be a God? Well, it's, 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 cra it's crazy if you really, really think about it, and I know that we get that, because it was the God of this world, Satan, that brought that in. He is the God of this world, but he's the one that brought that in. God, when you understand the scriptures, you, you understand that God is the one who has the plan to remedy that. He's got that plan to deal with it, but yet here we are blaming God for the sins that are in this world. Um, talk about an insult. We blame, man blames the true and living God for the sin in which man himself, along with Satan, brought into this, brought into this world. And when again, when you think about the fact that God didn't have to create man. He didn't have to create a way of salvation. 
you know, whenever we talk, sing songs and, and we, you know, think about the, you know, the, the years that we're going to have, the never-ending years of time of worshiping God, um, the things that he's done, we're never going to run out of days and reasons to give him praise because he didn't have to do all this. Matter of fact, whenever we, whenever we, we suggest for a moment that God is lacking in his love and care because he's putting up with all of this, this nonsense, this sin, this rebellion, the scripture says that what if God, willing to be long-suffering, put up with this stuff for you and I? That's how rich and merciful God is, willing to put up with that. I'm not that good. When somebody, you know, treats me bad, my flesh, my, my response wants to be to treat them bad in return. But God doesn't. That's the story we have. Verse 13 and 14, let's read those. It says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, when there is no sin, there is no law. Oop, you almost got me again there, Tim. <laughs> but sin is not imputed where there, when there is no law. Nevertheless, notice here what we're saying. Look what Paul's saying. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And so what we're seeing here is this explains that we are racially or from the lineage united to Adam and that that, um, that is not going to change unless you are in Christ. So nobody can get themselves out of Adam. The only way you can get, get out of that lineage is if you get into Christ's lineage. And guess what? Death is going to reign until... Death is swallowed up in victory. Matter of fact, turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 54 and 55. You're putting notes in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. This is talking about the rapture. Death is even going to reign in our lives, in our bodies as, the, as a believer until death itself is swallowed up in victory. Verse, we'll start in verse 53. For this corruptible, talking about this fleshly body, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And so... You know, as long as as long as we're in this flesh, this flesh is doomed to die. Whether whether or not you're under the law. And so whenever it says here, when it's talking about in verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law, nevertheless death reigned. And that's what it's talking about. Death reigned regardless of the Mosaic law being in place. And it's going to because of the lineage that you have with Adam, because you're in his race. Everyone that came from him is going to be, which is why Jesus, guess who he didn't come from? Guess why somebody else had to father Jesus Christ? Because he couldn't come from Adam. He had to come from the woman, but he couldn't come from the man. And that's why the Holy Spirit and the Father is, is where that conception comes, comes, comes into play. Uh, where there's no law, there is no sin, but sin and death reign. And so again, how does this take place? It's because of the doctrine of imputation. Um, Adam's sin was imputed. His nature um, transferred down to us. Um, death um, it, it comes upon even those who have not sinned after Adam's similitude. Well, what was Adam's similitude? Well, one, Adam was in perfection. He was in a perfect situation. He had not sinned. He did not have that corruption. But also, Adam had specific instructions. Um, there were those between Adam and, 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 
in uh, Moses before the law was given, where they had knowledge. Um, but yet what you see is, is regardless of the amount of knowledge, and this is really the testimony of, of mankind, is that no matter what, we choose sin. Man always does, always has, every, every single time. And so even those who are not under the law sinned. Look at Romans chapter 2. You remember this study. God says he judges people um, based upon their works. Even those who are not under the law will die absent from the law. I'm just going to say we're not... We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's right. It's in our nature. Romans chapter 2, verse 6. Look at that. Who will render to every man according to his deed. So there, there goes your excuse out the window whenever you want to blame Adam. Because guess what? You're going to, you sinned yourself. Every single one of us. Drop on down to oh, verse 12. For as many have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So Mosaic law isn't necessary for you to be judged. Right and wrong is something that God gave each and every one of us. You've heard of that thing called a conscience. Not to mention the fact that you go back to Scripture, and if you go to Jude, and I don't think I'll take you there because of time's sake, but you go to Jude, I think it's verse 14, and you've got the fact that you had um, you know, prophets back then. Um, you had uh, a conscience that was given. Um, you had uh, um, ways of knowing good and evil that uh, mankind sometimes wants to forget that they have. Whenever, remember whenever you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and, and all that, you remember whenever God told Adam not to, first of all, what was the name of the, that tree that he ate of? Tree of what? Knowledge. Knowledge of what? Good and evil. Oh, wait a minute. Knowledge of good and evil. You see, we, we, we forget that within man is the ability to understand good and evil. Cain knew it was evil to do what he did. He, he couldn't go to God and say, well, well, gee, God, I just I didn't know that it was wrong to kill my brother. No. The knowledge of good and evil, this conscience that we had. Again, you go back and you look at Jude and you see that Enoch was a prophet. Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Adam was still alive when Enoch was, when Enoch was, was given prophecies. Think of that. Adam was still alive when Enoch, the one that was taken, was given prophecies. So... Between Adam and the Mosaic Law, this verse isn't some suggestion that the idea that, you know, somehow God was unjust because, wait a minute, there was no law, so how could they, how could they be judged sin? No, the law just reveals the sin that's there. It shows the fact that you are a sinner. It shows that we are. And so even those that were not with the law, as we saw in Romans chapter 2, will be judged by their works because there is good and evil. Yes, Frank. Verse 14, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to them. themselves. They had law. They did. They, they, you under, they understood good and evil. We have that even today. We can, we can sear our consciences, but no one has to be told that it's wrong. I mean, I know our politicians don't seem to get that it's wrong to steal from somebody, you know, come in and take out of your wallet and go give it to somebody else. They may not understand it, but I guarantee even a two-year-old, you go take that little kid's toy, and he gets the concept pretty quick, doesn't he? Wait a minute, that, that's mine. And, and, see, there's this thing that's in us, this thing that we have called a conscience, and all of us have violated truth, um, from, from Adam on, all have violated truth, all have violated good. And again, I would point you to the fact that even the, even the idea of, of the knowledge of good and evil, this tree of knowledge of good and evil, shows this. And really, again, I, don't, uh, I won't take you there, but we, we understand that, that we don't die today, and this is what this is really talking about, we don't die today as a result of my sin. You don't die 
as a result of your sin. You die as a result of Adam's sin. And for to get to a sensitive topic and a, a very touchy situation, but to give you an example of this, babies, whether it's a baby in the womb or a baby who's just born, that baby hasn't committed a sin yet, but yet that baby dies. Why? Because they're in Adam. They're in Adam. And the only way to get out of that is to get into Christ, which is why God, why God did it that way. By one man sent into the world, and by one man justification in the life. That was the only way to do it, unless you want to do it yourself. Just some verses you can look at in Psalm 51.5 when it comes to, to that. Psalm 58.3, not encouraged to go look at these. Job 14.4, Job 15, verses 14 through 16. But again, understanding that death has passed on to all. That sin nature has passed on to all. Like Val said, we sin because we're sinners. That's why we sin. And so, so death has passed on between Adam and Moses, and that's what it's talking about. And again, so this verse, these two verses here are proving the fact of your lineage that your race is into Adam. Um, and our works, our works after that fact, prove that we are sinners. That's what it proves. And then it goes in to talk about the fact that Adam is a figure, a type of Christ. Not Christ is a type of Adam. Adam was a type of Christ. And so they have certain similarities and, and, and there are certain differences. And he's going to list some of the differences, but some of the, some of the similarities that I put down here, both had God as a father directly. He's our father, but why is he your father today? Because you're in Christ, right? And that's what scripture says. He's your father because you're in Christ. Adam and Christ had God the Father as father directly. Both were made without sin. Oh, let that blow you away. Nobody's been made without sin since Adam. This is one of the reasons why I've told you why I believe that it was a very short amount of time that Adam and Eve were in that garden. Because, yeah, if Adam and Eve are in that garden and they can uh, conceive Cain and Abel, they would have been born without sin, without the sin nature, and they weren't. All it says. So that means that Cain and Abel were not conceived until after sin entered the world. Something tells me in Adam and Eve, because we forget, so many times people make the wrong mistake, how many, how many rules were there in the garden? Two. Be fruitful and multiply. That was an expectation, and we know that was an expect expectation, because God, whenever... He judged the world at, at uh, um, Babel because they didn't follow the command that, that Noah that was given to Noah. What did he tell Noah after the, he, he gave him these things that you can do? And he said, be fruitful and multiply. And guess what? At, ba at Babel, they didn't do it. God came down and judged. They didn't spread out all over the earth. They, in the garden, there was two commands. Don't eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil and be fruitful and multiply. And for those who want to suggest, well, it was 130 years between the time um, the command came in the garden until Adam and Eve had their first children, I, I just happen to disagree. I happen to think that they would have been disobeying. They would have been disobeying God by not being fruitful and multiplying. And so, but I don't want to go down that and continue to prove that point. But, but yeah, I mean, so... Adam is the type of Christ. They were both made by sin. They both named by God. God named both of them. Both had an untainted image of God. When Adam was created, he had that untainted image. Christ has had that fullness of the image of God. Both chose death. Christ chose it for our sakes. Adam chose it whether understanding or not understanding, I don't, it's neither here nor there. He, he chose death at the expense of everything else. Christ chose it on behalf of everything else. Both performed one act that affected humanity. 
and both brought as a result imputation upon the world. That doctrine that I was talking about. Adam, because of Adam, the doctrine of imputation, they, everyone after him was imputed his unrighteousness in Christ, all those who believe in Christ. Um, this isn't universalism. It's not all those, all those who are after Christ. It's all those who believe in Christ have that righteousness imputed. And when I say believe in Christ, I mean specifically believe in the death, burial, and resurrections for your sins. There's a lot of people that believe in Christ, and that doctrine of imputation does not get applied to them. It's them that believe in the gospel. And so that's why, again, Adam, or in Christ. Just like you can't get out of Adam, I couldn't walk away from that, could I? Here's the next similarity. Once you're in Christ, guess what you can't do? You can't walk away. You can't get out of it. You want to talk about a glorious truth. Because here's another thing. If you could, you probably would, believe it or not. Matter of fact, to go read in tribulation period, and what is what is it saying there? God has to shorten the days. We won't be there. Let me make that clear. But God's elect themselves would be deceived and believe the lie if God didn't supernaturally do something about it. If God doesn't supernaturally make his imputation work in your life in such a way that you can't walk away from it, you probably would at some point. So what a, what a, what a some amazing truth. Well, let's see if I can get through four verses in two minutes. Verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Or if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God. There, notice that much more. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians 2.8 says that we're saved by grace through faith, and it's what? The gift of God. Yeah, not of works, it's a gift of God. And so you can see, again, that this... This thing that's being talked here, you have you have death that's brought on by Adam, but Christ Christ is the answer for that, and He brings this gift of grace. Adam brought judgment; Christ brought justification. You see that in verse sixteen, verse seventeen. We see that if death reigned by Adam, much more. And this is what I was talking about. Think of this. Let this impact you. As bad as it's been in this world, and there's been some pretty bad deaths. Val and I was just watching, or I wasn't watching. She was watching a thing about uh, these men who, who accidentally left their children in the car and the, and the children died from heat. This world has seen some horrendous deaths. Much more than that is going to be the grace that's going to be given to us in our life when we reign with Christ. So as horrendous as that was, much more great is that which is to come. That's what this verse is telling you. This is why we can we can we can face tomorrow. This is why you know you can have I forgot what's his name um, that, that that sang that um, it song. It is well with my soul. This is why it can be well with your soul because of the much more that is to the abundance to come. The verses eighteen and nineteen say, if one man's offense results in condemnation, then. Because of that, if by one man, then by one man, righteousness comes. And that's what I'm talking about. Man wants to see, well, that's not fair. Do you really want fair? Do you really want the fair? And that's what this is talking about. We don't, we don't want the fair. And, and God, for grace, said it didn't have to be fair. He devised a plan before the foundations of the world for this to happen. Woo! Any comments? Okay. You knocked that one out of the park, brother. 